It's a sweet, soft evening in late May. The air is scented with lime blossom and grilled meat. Relaxed young people in smart, casual clothes are shooting the breeze, enjoying a beer or a Prosecco at the end of the working day. All the world seems to be out tonight. Hare Krishna, African drummers. I could be on the Charles Bridge in Prague. But I am in Illyria. You won't find Illyria in the guidebooks. It's not on any maps. If the name rings a bell, it's because Shakespeare set Twelfth Night in Illyria. But he'd never been here and he hadn't the faintest idea where it was. The trains that brought me here crossed three borders. We've dropped down through Austria and slipped into Italy. We're pausing on our way to Croatia and Bosnia, just as Emperor Franz Josef might have done. If I'd been one of his civil servants, perish the thought, I'd be travelling through one country. To reach Sarajevo on Sunday, I will have had my passport inspected five times, because this charming, prosperous little corner of southern Europe is where the tectonic plates made their most violent shift since 1945. The capital of Illyria is Ljubljana, and this is where the former Yugoslavia began to fall apart. I don't think that there was ever a civil war in Bosnia. I think that was one of the, the spins that was put on it by nationalist forces and readily lapped up by Western media and, and, and politicians, perhaps eager for an opportunity not to intervene. Oh, it's a civil war, none of our business. In my mind, um, Bosnia was attacked, first from Serbia and then from Croatia. If you go to Sarajevo, don't try to speak about Serb or Croat. They believe they have three languages now, but more or less, but they speak what they spoke before. I call my language Bosnian after this war because of the political reason I have. I have a very strong political reason to call my language Bosnian. The hatreds that there are and there exists are certainly not ancient. They're very, very new. If there's anything ancient about feelings, it's ancient attractions. The land of the Croats, Serbs, Slovenes and Bosnians, between the Adriatic, the Danube and the Black Sea, was first called Illyria long before the Habsburgs arrived here. Illyria was a province of the Roman Empire. Then it was a province of the Empire of Charlemagne, and then fitfully attached to the Holy Roman Empire, even briefly the Mediterranean Empire of Napoleon. And off and on, it belonged to the Habsburg family. No wonder the history of former Yugoslavia is perplexing. It's almost impossible to reconcile the easy-going ex-communist republic with the bloody conflicts which erupted here a decade ago. I'm standing outside Ljubljana's new university. On my left is a column erected between the wars with a bust of Napoleon on it. On my right is a balcony from which the new independent Republic of Slovenia was pronounced in 1991. And to try and explain these questions, I'm joined by the historian Peter Vodopivets. Can I start by asking you, why is there a bust of Napoleon over there? It was meant in the sense that firm Yugoslavia, but with a Yugoslavia United Kingdom of these three nations, Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, fulfilled the idea already started by Napoleon, but this legend that he wanted to found a sort of a Yugoslav, South Slav political unit was born only at the end of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20s, when this Yugoslav movement started to develop in Slovenia or in the Slovene regions and in the same time in Croatia. At the end of 19th century, there was a movement of German nationalism and so on. There all non-German nations in the Austro-Hungarian Empire feel that they are coming to their end because that idea of national state will, of course, finally extinguish all those nations. That was the journalist and doctor, Dusan Keber. The greatest part of the Slovene population was up to 1918 very loyal to the Habsburgs. They simply, after 600 years of Habsburg rule, could not really imagine they could live outside of this empire because they believed surely that they were too small to get their own administrative autonomy. From the Serbian perspective, Yugoslavia was created to reward the victors of the Great War and punish the vanquished. But not everyone regarded the Yugoslav kingdom as inevitable, 
to San Kaber again. Then Slovenians, it's very, that's incredible. They just voted to join another completely unknown empire. They knew nothing about what can happen with some Slavic empire, with a Serbian king, etc., etc. Slovenia joins Yugoslavia because Italy is starting to seize Western Slovene cities. And the Slovenes recognize that you have to be large in Central Europe to survive. The disadvantage is that the Serbs regarded the areas of the former monarchy that joined Serbia in creating this Yugoslav state as their war prize. The historian Charles Ingrau. Hindsight tells us how much was left unresolved at Trianon, but the roots of Yugoslavia's problems lay in the settlement, or rather punishment, of Germany. There's a direct line between the creation of the fascist Ustase after the Nazi invasion of Yugoslavia and the ultranationalism which burgeoned after Tito's death. Whether it wore Serb or Croat clothes, it directly threatened the Slovenes. I, I must say that only when I saw the tanks around Ljubljana, then I really knew that it was the end of Yugoslavia. So that I believe that on the other side it was a shock for the army and the generals too. They believed really when they would come out of the barracks there would be no fights. When the opposite happened even they did not know what to do. And that was what saved us somehow. Comparing to what happened later in Croatia and Bosnia, this war was really a very small military conflict, not a real war. The poet Andrei Blatnik and the playwright Ewald Fliza bear witness to the ambivalence of Slovenia's lucky escape. The media didn't report actually that much on the war and we did influence it, of course. We did somehow have a touch with the war with the refugees coming in and the Slovenian government was doing a little bit to, to help them at that time. But still, this was definitely in Slovenia considered as somebody else's war, not as a war which takes place in a state that was not so long ago our state. It is this uh, complacency, obviously, which um, has influenced negatively um, the literary world as well, because nowadays, uh, when so many goods are suddenly available, so this uh, feeling of comfort, which may surprise you, but we all take it for granted, you see, and we have done so for quite a number of years, I think. One artistic collective who've bent over backwards to avoid complacency is the radical rock group Leibach, named after the German word for Ljubljana. They were born 20 years ago and modestly founded their own university, NSK. They were among the first artists into Sarajevo after the Dayton Accords. The atmosphere was extremely tense because, you know, everybody in Sarajevo then said that if it's not going to happen this time, that they cannot take it anymore. This was the biggest event in Sarajevo. We, we did two concerts in National uh, Theatre, and we proclaimed Sarajevo as a uh, NSK state territory. And we were giving away passports, NSK passports, diplomatic passports. We actually played them the program from our record, which we just issued in 1994. The title of the record was NATO, and we also played the um, one song, which is basically a Serbian uh, militant national anthem, Marson River Drina. Well, we actually played the last concert on the day when Dayton Peace Accord was signed. So after we left, a few days later, NATO troops actually arrived. How do you engage people now when they are no longer looking for somebody to express their own frustrated desire to challenge the system around them? I wouldn't say that uh, artists and intellectuals are completely meaningless. They Basically, it, it appears to be so, like that. But I think this is a, a, a certain transitional moment of uh, kind of self-satisfaction or something. The fact is that Slovenia does appear, and in fact it is, a very prosperous post-communist country. But uh, I think that uh, these things are going to change slowly again, because I think this is just... The, the prosperity cannot go on forever uh, with the same tempo, and this is just the beginning. As it happens, this superannuated rock band with a German name is the loudest Habsburg echo in Ljubljana. The fault line wiped out most of the medieval city in the 16th century, and the comprehensive rebuilding in the 18th obviated the Kaiser's penchant for town planning in the 19th. It's less than three hours now to our next frontier, 
and our next imperial capital. The train taking us there has a very grand name. It's the Geneva Samplon Venice Trieste Zagreb Express, and that's the only grand thing about it. It's chugging along at about 60 miles an hour, and all that's on offer for lunch is beer and peanuts. So let's see what Zagreb has to offer. Glavni Kolodvar Zagreb, the Hauptbahnhof, the central station. Designed from a blueprint in Vienna and replicated all over the empire. Flaking yellow ochre walls and dusty little putty over the main entrance. This is my first real provincial capital and it's certainly living up to expectations. It's a lovely day. Why don't we take a stroll? What makes a Habsburg city? Well, first of all, it's the colour, the characteristic yellow. Someone in Vienna called it Kaisergelb, imperial yellow. All these buildings carry the imprint of Franz Josef. They're heavy with pediments and porticos and columns, just like their cousins in Vienna and Prague. The flamboyant domes that ring this square between the station and the exhibition hall have a bit more joie de vivre. Now, where have I seen these shapes and decorations before? Of course, Budapest, where they go by the catch-all term eclecticist. And indeed, for much of the 19th century, Zagreb was run, to its distaste, by the Hungarian side of the dual monarchy. We'll turn left here and follow the guidebook's advice. Down Baruna Trenka are the ethnographic and arts and crafts museums and the National Library. Comfortably crumbling these streets are. No one's given them a makeover to turn them into Disney Reich. Now we're at the western end of the new town. It's green and spacious with yellow buildings all around it. And in the square before me, the National Theatre, home to opera and ballet, and also, I see, to the latest imports from Broadway and the West End. Currently, they're performing C.P. Taylor's play, Good. Well, maybe not quite the latest. But what a theatre. Big and broad and bedecked with columns, with a wonderful mint green fly tower. Designed, says my book, by Fellner and Helmer, the prolific partnership responsible for theatres and hotels and department stores all over the empire and further afield. Back in Vienna, where the Fellner and Helmer business was based, I was given a foundation course by the expert on the architecture of leisure and entertainment, Wolfgang Koss. Actually, all the large cities of the empire, they all did get new museums, uh, new whatever, and of course, new theatres in Krakow, in Zagreb, in Brno, in Prague. Uh, and a lot of these buildings were done by Fellner and Helmer. And in a certain way, this one could interpret as a kind of nation building with architectural symbols, like the railway stations or the schools or the, the military buildings. Because it was a multi-ethnical state, it needed this symbolic, wherever these type of buildings are, wherever there is a certain way of drinking the coffee in a coffee house or in a hotel, let's say with a glass of water beside the coffee and a silver plate, and reading the Neue Freie Presse, uh, there was Austria. And what do you have opposite the Opera House? You have the Coffee House. Well, you can't have opera without gossip and scandal and conspiracy, can you? Now, at this point, I have to come clean. I've been here before, briefly, three years ago, just before I left English National Opera. The world of opera, or rather that bit of it which involved public funding bodies and their new best friends, the management consultants, was becoming burdensome. So I escaped for a summer break in Central Europe, in Budapest, in Romania, and briefly here in Zagreb. A rather different Zagreb from the one I'm strolling through today. I kept a diary to remind me of what it was like on August the 4th, 1997. At supper in the old city, a veritable babel surrounds me. 
young Croatian girls, American soldiers with S4, a smooth Egyptian UN official. The girls explain why the shops are all closed. Tomorrow is a nationalist holiday to celebrate the recapture of Kanin two years ago. And to be sure, the following morning, the streets are crammed with 13-year-olds wrapped up in traditional dress like boiled sweets, and old farmers with horses and carts playing bagpipes. We're all on live Croatian TV, being hectored by Franjo Tujman. Since the summer of 97, Tujman has died, his party has been booted out of office, and a new liberal coalition is in power. The biggest noise in Parliament Square these days is a succession of wedding bands. One of the most prominent figures in the new Croatia is the sociologist Vesna Pusic. She comes from good Austro-Hungarian stock, although her grandmother has nothing but contempt for the Hungarian side of the partnership. Somehow in, in my, I would say, more inherited perception than perception, because there's one thing that you learn from the history books, and in that sort of more story of the family rather than history, um, Hungary was always seen as the less glorious period or the less happy relationship. Is there a sort of folk memory of the kind of imposition that the Hungarians made on this country in the period in the 19th century when they were in control? Obviously the Hungarian rule was much less enlightened, let's say. And by much less enlightened, I don't mean only less tolerant, but it was also less enlightened in terms of introducing sort of modern institutions of the state, liberal laws, things that Austria as a truly, I would say, multinational country needed to somehow introduce in order to survive in order to succeed in getting away from this very strong and powerful German influence, uh, we needed alliances with the other Slavic nations in the region. And Serbs were obvious choice. There was the same language, basically. They were bigger and they had a state. And the first Yugoslavia, in a way, came about, I would say, as a big misunderstanding between Serbs and Croats. They were doing the same thing, thinking each of the two peoples, two nations, that they were doing something else. You talked about misunderstandings, and one of the cliches of the reporting and writing about this part of the world from outside is the phrase ancient hatreds. And what you seem to be describing is ancient misunderstandings or ancient cross-purposes. Well, the, the hatreds that there are and that uh, there exists are certainly not ancient. They're very, very new. If there's anything ancient about feelings, it's ancient attractions. And at times of outside threat, there is certainly a long history of sort of looking at each other with both obviously suspicion, but certainly also with great interest. When Yugoslavia collapsed, Vesna Pusic was still in the USA working as an academic. Her mathematician brother Zoran, though, was already a civil rights activist in the increasingly violent climate of ultranationalism. At the end of November 1990, when uh, they changed the name of uh, uh, Square of Victims of Fascism, they changed his name to the square of uh, Croatian great man. This decision came directly from Tuzman, and I went to the shop and bought some blue and white plastics. For this, I cut uh, the word dwarfs, and I stick it over the square of Croatian giants, because I, I thought uh, those victims were logical consequences of the ideas of Ustasi or Nazis. What I was doing and some other people in many ways saved sort of this 
I would say, other Croatia, this Croatia that is dignified, that is normal, that doesn't want other people's territories, that uh, was absolutely against partitioning of Bosnia, that is democratic, that does have an urban, civic tradition that can answer to my grandparents, but also can answer to you know, whoever comes next, in a way. I made a date to meet Vesna Pusic down in the center of town at Charlie's Cafe. Well, I'm here at Charlie's Cafe. It's the middle of the day, and she hasn't showed up yet. Everybody else has, though. <laughs> I think uh, we would be lost in Zagreb without this place because the way that people feel free enough to say to each other what they think, no matter where you belong, to which party, even Mr. President's message, he drinks coffee down here and he's famous for drinking coffee with people. So we feel free. This is like a free territory in Croatia. Now, Croatia is very popular. This is really uh, its finest hour, but it wouldn't last forever. In eight months, people who voted for changes, you, you can't improve the economical situation in eight months. They uh, will forget about uh, who is really responsible for this. It's another silken evening. Supper tonight is in the courtyard restaurant of the Exhibition Pavilion across the Habsburg Square from the Central Station. The weddings have followed us down here from the high town. The bride and groom arrived accompanied by the strains of the Radetzky March. Since then, the band have run the gamut of every piece of Austro-Hungarian music imaginable. We've had the Blue Danube, we've had selections from Fritz Kreisler, and they've played their full repertoire of gypsy music. The funny thing is, I haven't heard anything remotely Croatian, but maybe given the events of the last 10 years, the band feels safer in the world of Johann Strauss and Franz Lehár. Now, as you can hear, this is where Franz Josef and I part company. He would have found the journey a pleasant and straightforward one, by rail across the mountains at Klagenfurt and down the rugged Dalmatian coast to his southern border fiefdoms. As we know, his heir, Franz Ferdinand, came by sea when he set off to launch the military manoeuvres scheduled for June 1914. The Thomas Cook timetable offers no such schedule. The war in the southern Slav lands severed all rail links through the territories and although the tracks have apparently been demined, the Dayton delegations chucked in the towel when it came to sorting out transport systems between the fragments of former Yugoslavia. So I've hitched a lift with the United Nations. They've got a fearsome defence force here. Over there, there are four cages with falcons in them, and they go under the name of the Anti-Bird Strike Team. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, check-in for the UN flight Cerebral. Thank you. My name's on the manifest. It's Mark, M A R K S. Yeah, the manifest. I called Sarajevo. Um, confirmed you're on the flight. Just need an ID card. And a passport. Yes, that's fine, sir. It's a quiet flight today. The only other passenger is a Canadian logistics procurement official. Sarajevo is no longer on the front pages, let alone the front line. The caravan has moved elsewhere. Can we give you a lift? Thanks very much. Mark. Mark. Yes. 20 Deutsch Mark. 20 Deutsch yes. Mark. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. Well, that certainly beat Air Croatia. There were no customs, no passport control, no currency exchange. The Deutsch Mark still holds equal sway here with the Kuna. And they've certainly been building. There's a cluster of new flat blocks over there. And here's a gleaming new petrol station. And over there, there's a shiny new office block. All higgledy-piggledy along the road into town, with gap-toothed apartments and crumbling staircases tottering into the street. But I see one sign of optimism and positive thinking. 
a big coloured advertisement painted on the side of the wall over there for Velux windows. Imperial Sarajevo actually starts here, a few blocks east of the Holiday Inn. The streets fringe the Miljatska River with fractured grandeur and charm. The tower block over there has a large slice taken off its side. The electricity station is a disintegrating shell. The Habsburg facades all have advanced ballistic eczema. And just here, there's an oddity. A 60s building, some Titoist public meeting place, with inscriptions carved on the side. Illyria, 4000 BC. Rome, 100 AD, Constantinople, 535, Bosnia, 1244. I can't see Austria or Hungary there, but I can see a single piece of graffiti next to the shell holes. The single word, why? And all the while, the hills sleep sweetly behind with little slender white minarets sprinkled among the green. You have to walk one block over to see where the Empire really pitched camp. On Marshal Tito Street, just after it becomes a pedestrian precinct, there's a Viennese elegance as far as the eye can see. And most of it's in better repair than Zagreb. Even the odd caryatid nervously holding up a balcony while waiting for the next bullet. The streets are packed with people, shopping, drinking coffee, eating ice creams, prodding the tomatoes in the fruit shops. Sarajevo is trying very hard. Someone told me that unemployment here is still over 50%. You'd never know it. The elegant young girls are out in their Fendi jeans, made up for the catwalk. Perhaps that's the point. Why are they promenading for all the world as if they were in Rome in the middle of the working morning? Hold on a minute. The whole parade just ground to a halt. Habsburg Sarajevo has just stopped. It isn't even a crossroads, but we've stepped over the tectonic plates. We're in Asia. The porticos and caryatids have been swept away. And in their place are low slate-roofed Ottoman houses and shops full of copperware and the sounds of artisans hammering away inside. The faces and the clothes haven't changed much, just the odd young girl with linen baggy trousers and a headscarf. But suddenly, we're in Istanbul. What I'm looking for, though, is Sarajevo's most celebrated spot. Now, if I turn right here by the mosque and I walk due south, I should get there. The guidebook says that if I keep on at right angles to the bazaar, with the east on my left and the west on my right, I'll find the exact place where Franz Ferdinand was assassinated just as I reach the river. And here, to mark the spot where, after a bomb and three bullets failed to hit their target, Gavrilo Princip finally brought the whole rickety scaffolding of the Empire crashing to the ground, is nothing. I don't understand. The guidebook says there's a museum and a plaque on the bridge, and footprints etched into the pavement. But for heaven's sake, it's called Princip Most, the Princip Bridge. Maybe I turned right too soon. It must be along here. No, if I keep on, I'll be back level with the market. I need some help. Are we in the right place or aren't we? Uh, yes, we are. Actually, you are facing the museum, the former museum, or what is left of it. Uh, I mean, the, the, the exhibits are no longer, so the exterior is still there. Interior is non-existent. That was Spomenka Beus, an English teacher at the university and a lifelong resident here in Sarajevo. 
and for almost 50 years the footprints were there now what I can see is just patches of some 10 year old tar asphalt and no footprints why was it necessary to remove it all? Uh, the thing was that for some 50 years, uh, Gavrilo Princip was celebrated as a hero. Somebody who did, uh, I mean, the great thing, assassinating uh, somebody's emperor in order to prove the sovereignty of the then Serb nation or Yugoslav nation. Uh, what happened with the sovereignty of Bosnia and Herzegovina is that people simply thought that it was assassination rather than heroic act. So I was right. Princip was airbrushed out of Bosnian history because he was a Serb. But he was fighting for independence from the Empire and the hated Hungarians. Now that I don't understand. No, there is something mysterious about this place. I'm back at the crossing point. To the north, Christian Europe. To the south, Balkan Islam. To the west, the Catholic Church. To the east, Slavic Orthodoxy. It's a crossing point, all right. A San Andreas fault in history. And Franz Ferdinand was killed just here, on the crack in the fault line. Well, I know someone who understands about these things. She works up there, above the Ottoman east side of town in the Bosnia-Herzegovina Heritage Rescue and her name is Marion Wenzel. Well, at the beginning of this war we heard a lot about ancient hatreds but my own experience from having worked closely with colleagues there for 30 years is that there weren't any ancient hatreds but that there were simply ancient ways of engendering new sudden hatreds which could be described as ganging up on people. And I encountered several wise people in my years there who believed that there were also prehistoric frames of mind that these people could turn on. And I had two occasions where I encountered this. Personally, the first one was when I was thrown out of the National Museum after I'd worked there a long time, and my colleagues threw me out suddenly. And I was very upset, and I was crying, and I went to an old Muslim lady, and she said, you have to understand our people. Our people were taught to always seek an enemy from outside. And they looked and looked and looked for this enemy from outside. And they couldn't find any, so they found each other. Marion Wenzel traces the threads of conflict in the region back to the Vlachs, who invaded Bosnia after the Romans left. She's also studied the mysterious secret societies which proliferate in southeastern Europe, like the Dragon Order. It was... As I learned later, the order of becoming a Hungarian magician uh, or shaman, but it was also a knightly order that was developed by Sigismund of Hungary when he had lost a battle against the Turks, the Battle of Mohach, and he wanted some other kind of glue to hold all these people together in this territory where he wanted allies to defend Europe against the Turks, and so he started the uh, Dragon Order, which was a knightly order like Masons and so on. The Dragon Order is very prevalent in the Croatian parliament, for instance. Most of its uh, members, uh, at least under Mr. Tujman, were members of the Dragon Order. What I do not know is uh, whether that Dragon Order was rather like masonry, something that was revived, or whether there was a stream of it that did go back to this uh, medieval Dragon Order. Vlachs. Dragons, Croat conspiracies, and ancient, ancient history. What's certain is that for 450 years, under the Ottomans, and then another 50 or so under the Habsburgs, there was peace and tolerance. Even in the Triune Kingdom of the Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs, after the First World War, there was stability. And under Tito, there was prosperity and non-alignment. And then... One nation-state becomes a multiplicity of nations, and one language fragments back into four. What must it feel like to be a writer under such circumstances? I asked the poet and secretary of the Bosnian Pen Club, Felida Durakovic. I have a very strong political reason to call my language Bosnian, as the same way as Croats have their own reason. 
but from the linguistic point of view, from the poetical point of view, it's a stupid thing to do. It's one language and, you know, the more version of one uh, sense or one meaning I have, the richer would be my poem. As a writer, don't you find it offensive that somebody should attempt to redefine your language? Yeah, of course. Of course, you know, I am the one who will define my poetical language. So I'm the queen of the language. I'm the king of the language. And I do not, you know, I'm, I'm smart enough and I'm old enough not to respect any kind of that division. And, you know, I refuse any kind of that. But I use any kind of useful thing they offer me. And I think it's useful for my writing. I think, let's get back to the main issue of this story. It is a heritage of Austro-Hungarian Empire. They started to do what Europe is trying and tending to do now. It was a, a magnificent attempt to live together and to let live other people, to know others and not to melt with them, not to make melting pot, but to make yourself as yourself, as an individual, if you want to be a part of whatever kind of ethnic group you were allowed to. And then there's the passaggiata. Every evening at seven on the dot, it starts. Franz Josef's elegant streets are crammed to bursting with all the youngsters of Sarajevo. They tell me that it started up again the moment that the shelling from the hills up there finally stopped with the Dayton Accords. And it doesn't come to an end when you cross over into the eastern half of the city either. It's a bit more dignified, a bit more restrained, and maybe the age range is a little older. But the spirit is the same. The desire to reclaim the streets, the desire to be the Mediterranean city that Sarajevo always was, and the mixed culture it still aspires to be. I have a friend who believes passionately in that ideal. He's the composer Nigel Osborne, and he works regularly here in Mostar, helping to rebuild the city's musical life and encouraging students and players to work with traumatized local children. The road to Mostar climbs into the ravishing Dinarian Alps, with snow still on the jagged peaks and a deep green river running below us. It's completely dislocating. Switzerland with mosques. Look, over there, a cluster of restaurants, a mountain resort with whole sheep turning on spits in the front yard. And at 10 in the morning, stolid families tucking into slabs of roast lamb and washing them down with glasses of beer. Apart from the odd local car claiming the ancient right to swerve round each bend on the wrong side of the road, the only other traffic is S4 jeeps and a UN petrol tanker. Nigel! Hello, Dennis. What a place it's, to meet. Well, it makes a change from Glyndebourne, doesn't it? <laughs> Nigel has founded the Mostar Sinfonietta to help retrain dispossessed local musicians with the help of some graduates from Edinburgh University. But the core of their work is with children. It was while I was working in Sarajevo in 1992 93 uh, on children's projects that I became very aware of how much this area was suffering. The figures, the provisional figures from UNICEF uh, were that we had the most traumatized children in Bosnia here, in the Mostar region. And so it seemed logical to extend our work here. I particularly wanted to do that. And so in 1994, when I could get back in here, I came and slowly went into alliance with the charity War Child, who had us were baking bread here, but had seen that music was rather important to people, that created the creative work that we've been doing with children was had some effect, and so they said, can we join forces and do something? So, so it was music and bread. Nigel took me for a stroll through East Mostar, just across the front line, in the oldest, most beautiful, most shattered part of the city. Yes, we're in the square where the Hotel Naretva used to be. We're looking at it now. This is an interesting building. It's Austro-Hungarian, but built in Islamic style. As you know, the Austro-Hungarians were 
sensitive to local culture and attempted to adapt themselves in these rather strange fantasies. And I think that Austro-Hungary I mean, came along at a point where uh, these forces of multi-confessional tolerant society were ready for a new injection. High culture, let us not be ashamed of it, was the principal rock to defend multicultural intolerance in this society. It's the one thing that held firm and didn't move. When I was talking to the pen club writers in Sarajevo, they said to me, this was always known as the most tolerant part of Central Europe. I still can't understand where that great tradition of tolerance went. I think it stayed here and it protected the culture. The intolerance uh, in Bosnia came from outside. The Pavarotti Music Centre is in the heart of East Mostar, a five-minute drive from the hotel. Nothing prepares you for this. Not the nightly news reports, not the television documentaries, not the shelves of books about the war in former Yugoslavia. And it's five years since the ceasefire. For almost half a mile, a cortege of empty husks, gap-toothed buildings, piles of rubble, and everywhere, the small plots of land crowded with plain white gravestones. I think there's more to music than just sitting on stage and giving concerts, asking people to pay to hear you play. It seems a bit backward sometimes, especially after seeing what, what the power that it has with children here. And it's just terribly rewarding for me and for the children. It's just always a joy. We've joined a convoy of young volunteers from the music centre who are on their way to a school in Bielopolje. After the thunderstorm, the hills are steaming as if they've been washed and hung out to dry. The destruction seems to be even-handed. A battered mosque to our right, a shattered Catholic church farther over on our left. What kind of experiences have they been through, the kids here? I'm glad to say I don't know exactly because I wasn't here, but I saw the, the damage afterwards and uh, it's just fair to say that they were subjected in various areas here in Mostar and in some, some of the surrounding villages to incredibly heavy shelling. For a good nine or ten months they were, a lot of them, living in cellars. Quite often when we came out here originally the children were either, in my experience, very quiet or they were extremely hyper, very bad concentration very nervous uh, and such like. But uh, they always went with us. They've always enjoyed us coming and uh, over a long period of time you could really see a change. Can I say cheers and good luck? Thank you. Cheers, cheers and good luck. I left them to it and walked back to the hotel. Every other building was battered beyond belief. But what I saw wasn't destruction. The streets were packed. There was a cafe every 10 yards with thrashing pop music and dozens of people drinking outside. A cafe society in a bomb site. My head was still full of the sounds of the Mostar Sinfonietta rehearsing Bartok. Bartok collected folk songs from all over the empire and beyond. Bulgaria, Croatia, Transylvania, where we're due next week even here in Bosnia. Sometimes the Sinfonietta plays them. And these folk songs changed his life. He found in them the DNA which unites cultures across all the man-made boundaries. He called it the miraculous circumstance. The Dragons of Illyria was written and produced by Dennis Marks, with technical presentation by Tony Wass and Tim Alcock. Fault Line is a director's cut production for BBC Radio 3.